Queen Elizabeth drives to her coronation. At the Queen's coronation in 1953, the aristocracy of the kingdom assembled. And at the top of the pile were the dukes. Excluding the royal dukes, titles given to the immediate family of monarchs, there were then 28 non-royal dukes. At the sacred moment that the Queen was crowned, they were also entitled to don their coronets. And the trumpet sound. Dukedoms are created by the monarch for reasons ranging from a grateful nation rewarding a major war leader to a king acknowledging his illegitimate son, the title then passing down the generations. I'm Duke of Ethel, uh, Marquess of Tullybarden, Earl of Strathtay and Strathardle, um, Viscount Belwida, Balvenie and Gosk, um, Lord Murray, um, Thane of Glentilt, and uh, I think I've missed one out, but uh, there are a lot of them. This is the list of my titles. Duke of Montrose, Marquess of Montrose, Marquess of Graham of Victory, and Baron Graham of Belford. You're all those? Yeah. So I'm the Duchess of Rutland, the 11th Duchess of Rutland, and this is my home, Beaver Castle. If I'd been born a boy, I would have been my father's heir and the 12th Duke of Leeds. But you weren't. But I wasn't. <laughs> the crowned queen... The last dukedom to be created was by Queen Victoria in 1889, and it is inconceivable that there will ever be any more. So, as they gradually become extinct, there are now only 24 non-royal dukes, what will become of those that remain? Do they still have power and wealth? What is it to be a duke in the 21st century? Dukedoms still own in excess of one million acres of Britain today. The classic image of a duke's stately pile is Blenheim Palace home to the Dukes of Marlborough for over 300 years. The dukedom was created in 1702 for John Churchill, a wily statesman and soldier who won a series of battles against the French. His greatest was the Battle of Blenheim. Until the Second World War, Blenheim Palace continued to run pretty much unchanged. Driving in today is someone who actually lived that Downton Abbey life. She was born Lady Rosemary Spencer Churchill, the daughter of the 10th Duke of Marlborough. No distant car park for her. When her father succeeded to the title, Lady Rosemary was a lively five-year-old. Right, shall we go along here? There were no pesky red ropes in those days. Yes, this I recollect very well, because there used to be a piano here, and we had to practice the piano. And there was a dagger under this picture of my grandfather, my grandmother, my father. And the dagger was there, so that if there was a fire, that the pictures could be cut out of their frames very quickly and thrown out of the window. But, of course, this was fascinating for a child. Instead of playing the piano, I used to play with the dagger. I'm not sure if it... Oh, I think it's still there, behind the chair. Well, I don't know if we're allowed to do this, but I think... There it is, you see. It's a huge knife. It was just home, you know. You, you just happened to live here and you didn't think it was really very extraordinary. When you were a child, how many servants were there? Indoors there were 36, I think. But they were all, the footmen were all very tall. My mother would like them to be six foot tall. As the average height of a male in those days was about five foot three, they were quite difficult to come by. 
but um, they were all about six foot. Why did you like them so tall? Well, I mean, in a house like this, you didn't want a lot of midgets walking about, did you? <laughs> I mean, you know, they didn't sort of, they didn't look right. I see, everything's on the slant. I hate furniture on the slant. I don't know why people have to put it on the slant. Would you rearrange it? Yes, I would. I just hate things on the slant. Oh, these are the um, invitations to the coronation. In early 1953, Lady Rosemary was selected to become a maid of honour to the Queen. But presumably your qualifications, Lady Rosemary, were not only beauty and height, but being the daughter of a duke. Yes, yes. Yes, I had a head start, because there weren't any other duke's daughters. No, there was, there was Marquis, there was Jane, Jane, um, Vain Temper Stewart. But um, otherwise they were mostly earls, I think. Way below you. Way below I. <laughs> yes. I believed one or two people were rather cross. And Cook told me that this should be nameless. Somebody was rather cross that her daughter hadn't been asked, but... From the roaring of the multitude into the quiet solemnity of the great abbey steps Her Majesty. Ah, yes, there we are, all going into the abbey. I'm at the back on the right-hand side. I've never seen this before. There I am on the left. The peers of the realm are already... Here are the dukes. My father would have been there, but I don't know quite where. Did you not discuss it with your parents? No, not at all. Did they say they saw you? No. They obviously did, because they would have been sort of fairly up to the top of the pile, so to speak. But no, I don't think we discussed it really at all. Do you find that odd? No, I don't think one did find it odd. You didn't find it odd in those days because you had lots of sort of very grand things that happened all the time. No, I never remember discussing it with my parents at all. And here we are on the balcony. It was amazing. The final scene. The others, I think, all went out around London afterwards, but I had to get home because my mother was roasting an ox in the park for Woodstock. There's my mother carving the ox. I'm there cutting up the meat. That world has in some ways disappeared. Lady Rosemary's brother was Duke for 42 years. His son succeeded to the title last year. But how are the other dukedoms faring? Blair Castle is at the centre of a vast ducal estate of over 140,000 acres in the Scottish Highlands. Assembling today is the only private army in Europe. The Duke of Athol was given the right to possess such a thing by Queen Victoria in 1844. And today, the Athol Highlanders Regiment consists of around 100 men, made up of locals associated in some way with the ducal estates. Its commanding officer lives 6,000 miles away. My father actually, he had no intention of uh, sort of accepting the role at all. He was going to be a, um, he actually made inquiries, official inquiries as to how he could get out of it. And the person that he consulted at the Lord Lyon said, you can either commit a schedule one offence or felony, they call it here, and go to jail for the rest of your life or die. This, you can't abdicate being a duke. This is the archive. Wow, so what is here? Well, this part at the top has the earliest documents. Um, there's 40 trunks of land charters giving the Duke title to his estate. But the very oldest is in here. This one dates from 1180. The next one is from 1199. 
the main thing was to prove that you owned a bit of land. So without a charter from the Crown, you had no proof. And these are the originals? Absolutely. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Family history matters. When the ninth Duke died, there was a very convoluted route to his successor, a young man who was his fourth cousin twice removed. We have a very simplified family tree here. So you come down straight from the third duke, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, but they have no male heirs, so you have to find the next male heir working your way back. So this was a brother of the fourth duke. You come down through this line of Georges until you get to the tenth duke here. The tenth duke had the perfect ducal image, as if from central casting. He was nearly six and a half feet tall, talked in clipped sentences, ending each with that Victorian aristocratic tick, what what? A bachelor, he died in 1996, and the whole process of finding the next heir started again. And then to get to the present line of dukes, you don't have to go quite so far back, um, just to the great-grandfather of the 10th duke and his brother again, and through the male line to the present duke. Your Grace, the Athol Highlanders are formed up and ready for your inspection, sir. Bruce Murray runs a small sign-making shop that he set up many years ago in an obscure provincial town in South Africa. In 2012, Bruce and his second wife, Charmaine, found themselves becoming the Duke and Duchess of Athol, along with 12 subsidiary titles. By the centre, quick, march! Being the Duke, he is automatically the Colonel-in-Chief of the Athol Highlanders. It's quite a responsibility. It's a very, very moving experience for me to parade for them. And I said to Charmaine, the Duchess, the other day that um, I'm so glad that I'm on my own there because if I had to turn around and, and actually have to uh, talk to anybody else, I wouldn't be capable of doing it. I'd, I've got a constant lump in my throat when I'm on parade. You know, I'm here because of an accident of birth and I didn't actually do anything to deserve this huge privilege that I have. All of this that happens is done for me, you know, basically. And um, it's just a very, very overwhelming um, sensation that I get to, to feel that. I haven't done anything to deserve it. The Duke and Duchess only see the family seat on their brief trip over from South Africa once a year. This is the entrance hall and it's a collection of firearms and weapons that the Dukes have collected. Just this morning, we were wondering how many of these weapons have actually been used, and um, it's quite sinister, but it's a wonderful collection. The trouble with grand estates is that, if not well managed, they can run out of money. In the 1930s, the elderly and childless brothers, the eighth and then ninth dukes, were facing ruin. But luckily, their distant cousin, the heir to the title, was about to marry a woman with a very rich grandmother. Her grandmother, old lady Cowdery, realised that the estate was in financial problems and the whole thing would probably be sold. So old lady Cowdery stepped in, paid off the bank debt, turned the whole thing into a company. She had the controlling shares, the deal was signed, she went to Paris for the weekend for a rest and dropped dead. My great-grandmother effectively bought the estate and her condition of buying it was that the Duke and everybody continued to live here, but her advisers ran it and they took a more business-like approach, and one, one aspect of that was opening the castle to visitors. So, by bringing in capital and a commercial approach, the rich old lady had ensured for her granddaughter that there would be a suitable estate along with the title. The title stays with the male line, but the 10th Duke's half-sister, Sarah, is the trustee, and she and her mother and her grandmother were the ones with the actual control. So the hereditary system does not mean that the males get the control. They might get the title, but um, unless you're very bothered about the title, it's running the estate that's more important. Sarah Troughton, the head trustee, is the half-sister of the 10th Duke. What do you think about the title only going through the male line? Um. 
huge relief. <laughs> I don't want to be a duchess. <laughs> really? Yes. I don't. I think um, it's it's a nice sort of ceremonial thing these days, but it's not something I, I prefer to get on with the business side of things. Had you inherited the title in the past, you'd have lived in the castle. Do you ever think about um, that? When I when I do think about that, I um, the the prospect of managing an enterprise like this absolutely appalls me. So actually, the way that it is now, I'm probably one of the luckiest dukes because I have this massive enterprise that's there to allow me to be a duke. Well, this is a picture staircase showing uh, a lot of my ancestors. It's lovely. I have this family tree. I can know more or less what they looked like. <laughs> Do you know who any of them are? No. <laughs> If I look carefully, I might be able to see John, the first Marquis of Athol, the chap in a very peculiar outfit. And this would be James, the second Duke of Athol. Do you see any resemblance between when you look in the mirror? <laughs> no, there's obviously a little bit of DNA in there somewhere, but I don't think I look like him. The Duke's sons, the Marquis of Talabadeen and Lord David Murray, are officers in the Athol Highlanders. We are soldiers, though, so in a real army. So in theory, we could sort of gather the men and go to war if we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in I this I don't know how age. effective we'd be. <laughs> Do you regret you're not in a position to live here? It's a very difficult one to answer because obviously I'm African and I always will be. Um, but honestly, no. And I think it's just quite special that we can have the African side as well as the Scottish side. So we have the best of both worlds. The Duke and his family play a symbolic role in all the rituals. The heir and the spare pull down their socks and get stuck in with the local fun. Just a bayonet. <laughs> No longer a strictly military occasion, the Duchess accompanies her husband. Yes. <laughs> but even at full speed, suitable respect is shown to the Duke. Back home, she's simply Charmaine, but here she's the Duchess and does what Duchesses do. Is it fun handing out the prizes like that? It is fun and it's nice to know everybody. Are you able to enjoy it? We do. We oh, love I mean, it. We That's love why it. we come here every yeah. year. Yeah, we love it. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of 24 people out of 7 billion on the planet who have got this responsibility to be a duke. Um, and it's onerous. You can't be trained for it in my situation. Obviously, if you're born and bred into it, it's different. But nobody can teach you how to be a duke. <laughs> this new South African line of long-distance Dukes of Athol came about because the dukedom can only go through male heirs. But when all male heirs run out, that is the end of the line. Well, there are some books, a couple of books in here. So where does that leave Camilla Osborne, whose father was the Duke of Leeds, a dukedom now extinct? The other rather grander book, which has got the title on the cover, and I don't know which one it was for, and that's the family book plate. There's the coronet. She lives in a new build close in southwest London but she still gets odd glimpses of the precedence at some dinner tables that her status as daughter of a duke can give her. You know, if I went to a lunch at Christie's, for example, they are extremely aware because they spend their days looking up dukes and viscounts and everything else. So you would, auto you would be put on the right of, of the, the Christie's director. I went to a lunch at Christie's and I was on the right and there was a woman who was on the left who was visibly irritated because she was older, better looking, better dressed, more jewels than me, but she was on the left. <laughs> and she was irritated. 
<laughs> did that ever so slightly please? Yes, of course it did. And here, these pictures were taken by my father's father, who was the 10th Duke. The bathroom pays homage to the boyhood of her father. Well, there he is, us sitting in a sort of rather charmingly battered straw hat, looking winsome and sad. And that is one with his mother. The Duchess had struggled to provide an heir. After four girls, finally, she produced a boy. The arrival was celebrated with bonfires and fireworks. His title at birth was the Marquis of Carmarthen. The story of him being on a bus and the bus stopped and he apparently said, Nanny, Nanny, why aren't we moving? And she said, because there's a lot of traffic on the road, you see, we can't move, the bus can't move, they can't move. And he went, well, they wouldn't do this if they knew the little Marquis was on board. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I suppose he'd been, he was known as the Little Marquis. The family seat was Hornby Castle in Yorkshire. Within a couple of years of succeeding to the title in 1927, the new young duke put the castle up for sale. With cash in the bank, he drifted round Europe, ending up on the French Riviera. This is a picture of his wedding to the Serbian ballet dancer. Uh, he got married in Nice. There is the bride, who's looking pretty satisfied. My father, who's looking understandably apprehensive and nervous because there is his mother, who appears to be wearing her gardening clothes and certainly a gardening hat. She's looking as if she cannot really believe that her only son and heir is marrying the Serbian ballet dancer. The marriage to the Serbian ballerina ended when she went off with an American millionaire. The Duke remarried and they had a daughter, Camilla. To avoid heavy English taxes, they moved to Jersey. He was probably bored, bad-tempered, miserable at being made to live there. My mother was much younger and she met and fell in love with a young, good-looking guards officer who was in the Coldstream Guards, with the result that she left me and my father. My stepfather had to leave the army and apparently his commanding officer said, well, Lawrence, this is jolly sad, isn't it? I mean, you know, chorus girls are one thing, but I'm afraid duchesses are quite another. <laughs> Within minutes, a young woman had got her tabs on the newly available Duke. She was terribly tall. She was nearly six foot, so she was bloody frightening as well. As well. Why do you think she married your father? Do you think the title had... Oh, been? yes. It had an enormous amount to do with it. But looking back, I mean, she wanted to be a duchess. What do you think about your resemblance to him? Oh, I love looking like him. I do, yes. Well, it's such a link, isn't it? Um, my stepmother, in her less than generous moments, said it was a great shame that I looked so like him. <laughs> I was 12 when he died. I was at boarding school and they summoned me back. But I wasn't allowed to say goodbye to him. I didn't see him before he died. There was a funeral which I wasn't taken to. And she knew under the terms of the trust that she couldn't inherit anything other than his personal possessions. And she was obsessive about money. But I remember her going on and on to a friend and this friend saying, oh, Caroline, you know, I do think perhaps you could stop now because it's, it's really not very nice for Camilla to listen to all this. Oh, well, she'll be all right, because she's got the money. And I was, what, 13 or something at the time? On her father's death, the title went to a distant cousin living in Rome, Sir Darcy Osborne, a former British ambassador to the Vatican. He was in his 70s and a bachelor, and when he died just six months later, the Dukedom of Leeds became extinct. My father, if he'd still had the place in Yorkshire, he'd been like Bedford or Devonshire, or those that have got a, a purpose, which is what I'm trying to say. But I think it gives you a purpose. And I think maybe that's why he wasn't a happy man, because he had absolutely no purpose in his life, except getting through, getting through the day by going to the cinema or going to the tailor or having a, you know, the third perno, um, that was his life, actually. When Hornby was sold, 
The coronation robes were under a bed, so they got, they were sold. But what remains are the three coronets. The ducal coronet, the duchess's coronet, and the marquis's coronet. And that, you see, there was a, apparently you kept your sandwiches in there during the coronation. Because it went, you know, you were there for hours and hours and hours. So you would just have that on your, on your head. Actually, that feels quite comfortable. <laughs> it rather suits you, I have to say. I appreciate enormously what I've got. But I think maybe, like my father, if I hadn't had it, I would have had a happier life or a more fulfilled one. I mean, I, I, when you read death announcements, don't you? You read them and it says, after a life well lived or after a fulfilled life. And sometimes in my more gloomy moments, I think, yes, I, I wouldn't say that. Really? And not that I've been unhappy, but I just feel I've had sort of the same slightly aimless life as my father did for different reasons. The Dukedom of Leeds had been created for a crafty Yorkshire politician who had helped bring William and Mary to the throne in 1689. The Dukedom of St Albans was created for less elevated reasons. Simply for the bastard son of King Charles II, and the celebrated actress, Nell Gwynne. The family seat for many years was Bestwood Lodge in Nottinghamshire, but that is long gone. The 14th Duke of St Albans and his Duchess live in a terraced house in a quiet street in central London. Um, well, he's the, the 10th Duke. I mean, he's the, the same chap as that. And he, he was the, sort of the good duke, the 10th duke. Was the last person to make a speech in the House of Lords until I did it. Oh, really? 127 years later. <laughs> and that, I suppose, is our, our coronet. Do you still have the coronet? Yes, male and female. And, and the robes. The we have the coronation robes. Oh, really? Where are they? Up, up in the attic. Oh. Well, we'll talk about those later. <laughs> <laughs> All the coronets yeah. aren't there in your study. Oh, are there? Yes. On the top? Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. That would be, that would be, your, that would be your one. I it? think that is, <coughs> actually. It's, it's, a, it's a red one because it? it's the original box and oh, it's yeah. very, very fragile. Ah, now this is Murray's one. I think they're rather lovely. That's Murray's. You hold yours, Murray. And I'll just get out oh. my one, which oh. I think is just so pretty. There's a, an original pens which would be, say, 1680. If you see those, that's what's so brilliantly clever. Those are the pens you would put in on in your hair, and that would keep, which the Queen obviously does. So what I do is I do that second, and I'm pressing it into my, my scalp, and I do that, and then I'm pressing it in like that, and of course that is amazing because that's it. Look. Hmm. We have had no reason to wear never, never. ever, ever <coughs> to wear it any more hmm. than we've had any reason to wear the robes. And actually, in fact, the... Well, I, wrote, I wore the robes for my portrait. For the portrait. Well. Right. <coughs> and how should one address you if one's being well, that, <laughs> well, that's quite... Your, a, your Grace. It should be <coughs> Your Grace. Quite a few, a few people do. Quite a few of the restaurants call me Your Grace. Quite a few. Uh, but then, on the other hand, you also get people that, that, that don't. And so, well, that's, f we, you know, we're very totally relaxed, actually. But do you quite like it? Well, I, th I to be honest with you, I like, I do actually like formality. But I've, I've, I've always liked formality, regardless. I don't like Christian names, for instance, terribly. So, it wouldn't suit me to be... Uh, I don't like being called Gillian, actually, particularly by people I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's only just me, really. So what should I call you? Well, you can call me Gillian, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> but that's very generous. And well, no, not at all. But if, on my first meeting you, what should I have called you? Or did I call you? I, I think I avoided it. I think you avoided it, which I think is a very sensible thing to do, because I think I could always often avoid things that I don't want to get involved with, and then I don't hurt anybody's feelings or 
or be on you know, any, any problems about it. So I think I would have done the same. So, for example, when you're booking an aeroplane ticket? Oh, that's an issue. Because they say they can't put in Duke of Duchess of... because it won't fit into the computers, which is what we're always being told. So we go in under Mr and Mrs St Albans. Fine, we don't mind. Hmm. But because actually we, we're, not, uh, we're not the kind that would want to necessarily throw in a title just because we want a better seat or whatever. You know, some people do that, but we don't. But anyway, there you go. Terribly pretty, isn't it? Very, very. Yeah. Now, I'm afraid, having mentioned the, the your robes, we have to see the robes. Where are they? Are they next door? Oh, well... Well, in the attic. Well, well, on the attic? Yeah, but that really is an ordeal. Is it? Well, I I'll, I'll 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 take... No, 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 you're Let's not going into the attic. Okay. That's banned, because that's <laughs> where everything but the... The kitchen sink oh, is. The health, health and safety, too. The health and safety. <laughs> Luce! Hi. Uh, we need you, Luce. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to come up with me, Luce. <laughs> I know. Well, don't worry. We could just put the ironing board to the side, okay. Luce, for a second. Sorry. No, that it's doesn't hot, matter. Hot, don't... No, no, don't worry. <coughs> we could just take that down <coughs> for a minute. This would be easier in here, actually. Shall we let Luce through? Yeah. Yes. So, oh, that's easier, yeah. It really is, because... Murray's is terribly heavy, and in his, well, look, you see, in his case, very, very frail. Fact. Show what we, we've seen. It seems to be molting a little bit. Yes, it is. It's molted tremendously. But as long as the moths haven't got in it. The ermine is looking very unhappy. It is rather, isn't mm. it? Fortunately, this is a K, this one. It's oh, so... it is beautifully made. So that's lace from... Yeah, 16, whatever. So it is the original. Look. Shall I take it now? Yeah, why don't Andrew? you? Oh. You take it, Michael, and then you can... <coughs> Look, I think that is... Wow. That is what is mm. really lovely, I and think. Sorry, did, was there a bit of ermine, uh, as a sort of shawl under that? That, yes, that. Now, uh, this, is that, or is that so just you, a spare? It's just... Uh, no, that, oh no, that clips isn't... Up, it clips on to oh. here, actually. Look, Murray. In ah. fact, well done you for spotting that. We'll have it that like is, that. That's nice. Because I think that's oh, yeah. the ideal thing to yeah, do. Yeah. Look at it. It's simply beautiful. Mm. How did you meet Murray? And what was your attitude to his title? Oh, w well, I... First of all, I met Murray um, at a dinner party. As far as, him, as his title went, I think it's a charming title, actually. I think it's a particularly pretty one. But actually, my um, daughter's godfather was the uh, Duke of Manchester, and I have known quite a few, so it wasn't as if it really was at all a sort of anything out of the ordinary, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely out of the ordinary. You're mm -hmm. very, very special. But not the title, particularly. What have we got here? Well, we have me here. And uh, my coronation robes and a falcon. Core, a live falcon? No, stuffed, I'm afraid. Because I'm hereditary grand falconer of England. Hereditary grand falconer? What does that mean? Well, it means nothing now. I think there used to be a salary of a thousand pounds a year. Really? Yes, one time. Up till a few years ago, one used to get a quarter of a deer twice a year from Richmond Park. But uh, that was stopped by Tony Blair on the grounds of economy. <laughs> what did you think of that? Well, it was a pretty poor show. Because the Archbishop of Canterbury used to get it as well, and one or two other people. Murray, did your ancestors leave you a vast stately mansion and huge wealth? No, they didn't, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so, so, can I ask, what do you... Did you have you worked for a living? What, what have you... Yes, been? I have. Doing what? Well, I'm a chartered accountant. The Duke's son and heir is Charles Beauclerc, who used to use his courtesy title of the Earl of Burford, but now chooses not to. That, that is one of the dukes. He is a teacher and part-time historian and takes rather more interest than his dad in the family's history. And that's the ninth as a boy, so obviously the father of Clement. Clement. I mean, do you feel a connection to these ancestors? Not particularly, really. I, I don't, but, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. But I'm probably exceptional in that. 
I think Charles mm. does more, don't you? I, I'm sure he does. Mm. To, to, yeah. su to some of them, yes. Obviously, mm. some are obscure and they're just pictures and so on, and they don't really come alive in your mind. Um, others do, and I think, um, obviously, we're fortunate in being aware of the story of our family in a way that a lot of people aren't, and therefore, I think you can choose the way in which you become part of that story. I mean, we're all actors in it. One day, Charles will be the Duke of St Albans. It is often thought that any man in possession of a grand title must not be in want of a large stately, but that is no longer the case for this dukedom. Charles, though, is fascinated by Bestwood Lodge, the pile that in other circumstances he might have inherited. It is now a Best Western Hotel. Yes, this is Bestwood Lodge, which was built between 1862 and 1865 by the 10th Duke of St Albans. And there's a lot of fantasy to it. You know, you've got the figures of Robin Hood and his merry men over the porch there. It was described at the time as acrobatic gothic, which I think is a, is a pretty good description. Charles and his girlfriend Sarah are hoping to put on plays here and have been delving into its traumatic family history. The 10th Duke, a talented entrepreneur, made a fortune and with three sons, he thought he'd set up the family for generations to come. But within months of his death, it all started to unravel. His son and heir, Burford, as he was called, three months after he succeeded, he was certified, uh, confined to an asylum in Sussex, and that's where he spent the last 36 years of his life. Then the youngest brother, Lord William Beauclair, also proved mad, and just after leaving Eton, he was sent to the Priory, Roehampton. He was there for 52 years, completely forgotten by everyone. And the middle brother, Obby, who became the 12th Duke, was a restless soul um, who wandered around the world. And I think he became quite an embittered man. And that's what fascinates me, is why, what created this mental illness? I mean, was it partly societal? Um, were they sensitive souls who couldn't harness themselves to the whole imperial design? Or was it something more personal, something the way they had been brought up? It's like a kind of haunting passed down from generation to generation. So I think the key is to become conscious of them, and then that demon is purged through for future generations. One of the reasons I gave up the title in the first place is because people's perceptions of you can actually create a sort of straitjacket. It often attracts people who just want to know you because they're snobs, and therefore you can fall into the wrong company very easily. I think much better just to be Mr. Beauclair, go about your business. <laughs> and, uh, but yes, if I felt I could use it in a, a powerful and creative fashion, then I, I would. If Charles doesn't take up the title, this might be the last practical incarnation of it. The Dukedom of Rutland was created as the result of a very pushy mother who demanded of Queen Anne that her late husband's military heroism be rewarded, making her son-in-law a duke. This tradition of strong women has continued. I remember very well the feeling of driving up here to Beaver Castle in my rather beaten up old Fiat and having to stop and take my breath back for a moment and seeing this extraordinary castle and thinking, whew, I'm going to stay there. <laughs> the building itself is so imposing, it takes people's breath away. Emma Watkins was a farmer's daughter from Wales when she met the then Marquis of Granby, heir to the Duke of Rutland, owner of Beaver Castle, at a dinner party. Within a couple of years, they married, and she became the Marchioness. When her father-in-law died, her title changed. The upgrade to Duchess, how much of a difference did that make? To me? Um... Well, it makes a difference to others because they perceive you as a duchess and suddenly, you know, to many people, bearing in mind there are so few of us in the country, 
it is all quite whew, a duchess, you know. She might be sitting up in an ivory tower with a sort of crown on and quite old and quite scary. We're in our private rooms here, and these are the rooms that are not open to the public 24-7, and so they're areas where we can have some space. Um, and out here is our private terrace, which is, I suppose it's our back garden in a sense. And as you can see, we've got our swings and our dog kennel, our five dogs. In marrying Emma, the Duke found someone with whom to start a family, who also turned out to be a determined and energetic estate manager. But three years ago, the marriage ran into difficulties. With over 300 rooms at their disposal, they came up with a relatively simple solution. He lives in one tower and delves into the family archives. She lives in another tower and, as chief executive, runs the place. Morning. Morning, everyone. 7.30am and the senior staff assemble for her Grace's weekly meeting. Debbie? Um, morning, you Grace. We've got um, four sign-ups in the next two weeks. It's a bit like when the king dies, long live the king. When the duke dies, long live the duke. And there was an amazing moment that will remain with me forever when my mother-in-law, there was a large black tin of keys, enormous great keys, and she handed me the box and said, good luck. But actually what we've got to do is address where it fell down. And, and so I spent the week and there wasn't one room that I hadn't managed to get into, so... You have to kind of know what it is that you're taking over. I'm now going up onto the roof. I'm meeting our architect. And in a moment, you're going to see why it's called Belvoir. Beautiful castle, beautiful view. They were Norman French, the Manners family, and they couldn't really pronounce beaver. So they called it Belvoir because of the beautiful view. Let's go and see if my architect is down here. Peter! Oh! I'm on a different roof to you. So well, how do I get out to that one? You come up the spiral stair, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Uh, across and through the okay. Middle King's room. Middle King's room. I'll be with you in two minutes. Pop down here and find the right roof. Hi, Peter. Where that's, it bubbles. Yeah, that's that's right. That's all. That's all the corrosion building, so that's up, building up underneath. So, what problems does that create underneath? It just makes the lead thin. Right. How old is this lead? It's as old as the building. We're getting on for two hundred years. There's a little mark here. Eighteen eighty-three. Wow. You can see what it is. It's a little man riding a penny farthing. Yeah. So, what sort of price are we talking about to have this re-leaded? It would use up an entire year's budget. So about 100,000. And that's just one section of the two acres of roof. Looking after the future extends beyond mere buildings, of course. The Duchess took her duty seriously and after three daughters, produced two sons. Well, obviously, it's very important that you have a boy because boys carry the title and everything is entailed here at Beaver, so everything goes with the title. There is definitely a feeling that I better have a boy. <laughs> the one that struggled most probably was darling Hugo, who at four and a half said, Mum, when Charles dies, do I become the Duke? <laughs> I said, Charles isn't going to die and you will never be the Duke. But he sort of gets it now. I think as long as you're very, very clear with children from the outset about how it works, there's no confusion. In the magnificent Elizabeth Saloon, there's a photo shoot for Country and Townhouse magazine. It's black. You won't notice yep. the bulges. The 21st century Duchess is conscious of the need to market the place. And with its Midlands location, she especially targets the lucrative Asian wedding business. There is, after all, a certain Bollywood over-the-top quality to the decor. Looking across out, out the window. 
Today, selling it as a family home are all the female members. You look gorgeous. As daughters of a duke, they take the courtesy title of Lady along with the family name. Lady Violet, Lady Alice, and Lady Eliza Manners. Do you ever think, as the oldest, about not being able to inherit? I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't want to break tradition, actually. I think, for, for me personally, I think, I think in, in years to come, I think it will be welcomed and I think it should happen that, that you know, the eldest should be allowed to inherit. But I'm quite happy that it hasn't changed for me. <laughs> you know, my brother, I think, he's got broad shoulders and he'll be able to carry the weight properly, I think. So, genuinely, no tinge? Of no tinge, not, not at all. I mean, I really... I have been asked a lot and I just, I really, really am just so lucky to have been able to enjoy it. <laughs> did, did you play in this sort of room when you were kids? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This was our, this Halloween was our big party special this room was for, yeah, Halloween parties. Yeah. We, yeah. And we came out with the most amazing game called Runner. So it was literally, it, there was no structure to it, you would just chase each other around until you caught each other or found each other. <laughs> Or someone got really lost. For inheritance tax reasons, the castle has to be open for a certain number of days. We renegotiated with the government. We looked at reducing our days that were open to the public. I took the business right back to its roots, really. The Duchess got the open visitor days down to around 30 a year and replaced them with high-income, upmarket shooting parties. I looked at bringing people in to come and shoot here from all over the world, to come and stay in the castle, to be waited on and looked after as they had have been 200 years ago. In the 15 years since she took over, the Duchess has transformed the 16,000 acre estate. She got rid of large numbers of employees and reordered priorities. I think, Nick, your family have been here for how, how many generations? Hundreds of years. I mean, the best part of 50 years I've been on this estate, on and off, and I've just seen a total change. What's happened? Well, I made them all redundant. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I'm not going to go down. Well, I did. It wasn't that anyone was wrong. It was just, for me, it was just that people became accustomed to it the way it was. And... So what did you do? So I, I made a lot of people redundant. It brought this place back to being a properly run estate. But it was controversial? Yes, it was controversial, yeah, they're definitely, but change is going to be controversial. The old seat of power for the aristocracy was the House of Lords. Tony Blair's government managed to abolish all but 92 hereditary peers. Amongst them, there are only three dukes. The Duke of Montrose is a former Conservative Shadow Minister for Scotland in the Lords. I'm going down the corridor towards the House of Commons, where the pictures are all to do with the time of the Civil War. And this picture here is a picture of my ancestor's execution which took place in 1650. The Duke's most famous ancestor, the first Marquis of Montrose, led the army for Scotland and then switched allegiance to the English throne. But he was finally defeated and captured and taken to Edinburgh where he was hung for three hours of a gibbet and then cut down and dismembered and his limbs sent and hung on the gates of all the main cities of Scotland. I mean, our family has been involved in most of the events that have defined Scotland and its battles with England, one way or another. We then go on to the fourth Marquis, who, as president of the council, he supervised the signing of the Act of Union. And that's his picture there. As he had been instrumental in getting Scotland to join with England in the Act of Union, a grateful king created for him a dukedom and the fourth Marquis became the first Duke of Montrose. And then you get my grandfather, who's the sixth Duke. He joined in in the early stages of the Scottish National Party when what they were looking for is pretty much what we've got now, which is a devolved assembly within Scotland. Okay. 
As well as his duties in the House of Lords, the Duke is a working hill farmer. What have you seen? A sheep on its back. I hope it's not dead. It's still heavy and lamb. <laughs> well, that was well caught. So she'd be better off that way around. Do you sometimes get the sort of sycophancy? It'd be very rare, I would say. Um, it might be different in some areas uh, where there are still people who can afford to be very grand, but I think uh, sycophancy mainly comes to people who are very rich. When they were very rich, their stately pile was built in the Victorian era by his great-great-grandfather. They had the idea that life would go on in a very grand style, but of course it belonged to a lifestyle which was about to just vanish away. Today, Montrose lives in a more modest 1930s house, stuffed with mementos of the family's thousand-year history. These are the socks and the hat that he wore at his execution. And then this cloth here was supposed to be where his heart was wrapped. As with so many bits of history, one is charged with keeping something alive for other people to appreciate and understand. Is that it? It's, Do you want me to be your valet? Uh, it's, <laughs> these are my robes for the opening ceremony of Parliament. Dukes are allowed to have four bands of ermine that go right round the, the body like that. Uh, if I was an earl, I would have three bars. And if I were just a baron, I would have two bars. But at yeah. some point, there will be a new monarch. Will you attend? One would have to wait to be invited. I don't know that uh, what the protocol will be by the time there is a successor to the Queen. Um, you may find that Dukes are no longer in the House of Lords at all by that time, and they're probably not considered to be very important people. As the last vestiges of their constitutional power fade, how will dukedoms with a real sense of grandeur survive in the centuries to come? This year, Blenheim Palace will have 700,000 paying visitors tramping through its very grand doors. James, formerly the Marquis of Blandford, only recently became the 12th Duke of Marlborough. He had a sticky time in his early life. A publicly documented drug addiction and a passion for fast cars hardly prepared him for the now professional business of running such a vast estate. Today, he will open a vintage car event. Hey, Casper, come on. <laughs> How are you? And Andrew, do you know what he does? He organises the whole event. Which one do you drive? Your daddy drove that. Yeah. Go. All the way around the palace grounds. So it's a pleasure well you allowing us into your home. Baby, really silly. Is. It's an honour having you here. It really is. The Duke's sister is Lady Henrietta Spencer Churchill. Oh. Hello. Their father was the last Duke to live full time in the private quarters. So this is the butler's pantry. This is again on the private side. You'll get your bearings in a minute, but if you went through that door, you would end up on the public side. So what's here? What are we looking at? This is our bar. You know, when we have guests, this is where either they help themselves to drink or the butler helps them to drinks. Um, faux books. In here, there's a behind the scenes. The, Cupboards. And then this is is a sort of service staircase which goes all the way up. Done. You can, you can. Not very interesting, but um, so that goes down to the basement level, the lower ground, and then actually, if you go all the way up, you can get into one of the towers, which of yes. course is where we spent a lot of time as children because it was much more fun going to all the places you weren't supposed to be. Well, this is family dining room. As you see at the moment, the table is set, what, for eight people. Um, if it's just en famille, we actually have a round table. 
or just a small table in the, in the bow part of the window here. The family sitting room. So it's really our telly room too, you know, it's it actually, as you can see, very cosy, although probably fairly large proportions. As early as the late 19th century, the financing of an estate like this became a huge issue. In the case of Marlborough, there was then a relatively simple solution. The ninth Duke was very much told he had to <laughs> marry an American heiress. It was, as you know, very much an arranged marriage between Consuelo Vanderbilt, who came with a large dowry. And it's really thanks to her and the Vanderbilt money that the house is in such good shape today. He sort of, I think, bit the bullet and said, right, I've got to ne not necessarily marry for love, but for the love of Blenheim. And they duly got married, produced the heir and the spare. She always referred to her two sons. And, you know, it wasn't a particularly happy marriage. And in a, in a funny way, it's probably easier today to make it work than it would have been in the past. Why? Because it's run like a business, so we have a lot more opportunities, you know, to make money in order to keep the upkeep of the house. Whereas before, you were perhaps relying just on um, farming or, you know, investments. Um, now it's or actually... American millionaires. Or American, exactly, yes. <laughs> well, we might have another one of those, you never know. It might be from some, might be China or somewhere next time. <laughs> James has slotted into the role. Things are really carrying on just as normal. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure on behalf of my wife and my family to welcome you all here today for this inaugural Salon Privé event at Blenheim. The Duke presents the public face of Blenheim, now owned by a trust and run by a professional team. Well, I was very fortunate to be appointed in early 2003 as the first chief executive at Blenheim, and that was really the Duke at the time and the trustees decided that this was a time to really commercialise the business and to really get a grips with everything that Blenheim had to offer and really drive the business forward. How does it work hierarchically? Who, who's in charge? Well, obviously the Duke is resident in the palace. It's very much the home of the, Duke, the, home of the Dukes of Marlborough, currently the 12th Duke of Marlborough. Um, I report into a board of trustees who work very closely with the Duke. So really above the Duke and above me is a board of trustees. My operations director. Have you ever seen the palace from above? Uh, only when I went up and re-gilded the balls on the top. Did you? <laughs> Was that fun? <laughs> yeah, hard work. Is it gold? Yeah, it's gold leaf. But you put gold paint, it comes off every year. When did you do that? Were you the Duke, or was it before? No, no, no. Heather, when was it? It, 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 was, it was over 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I'm going inside. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Nice Bye-bye. What do you think of the hereditary principle? I think it's part of our DNA. I think it's part of the heritage. Of this. I think what makes us special. We're the envy of the world because of places like Blenheim and the heritage and the private historic houses are utterly unique. But I think the real jewels are the ones that are in private ownership because there you've got the love and the sweat and the dedication of a family over generations to keep, you know, to keep their end up, if you like, because no no incumbent wants to be the incumbent that doesn't hand on in a better condition than they received it in. In the 21st century, dukes may be a dying breed, but splendid heritage or privileged anachronism, their survival is sure to be a magnificent struggle for generations to come.